I'm your host, as always, Headphones Neil, bringing you the latest episode of the podcast. A little bit later than usual, just because um, I was working on a computer update and um, I ran into some issues that I did, wasn't expecting doing some back end research. Um, I found out that it was going to be a little bit trickier than I thought it would be, um, or at least trickier than I expected it would be. So um, I did get, or I was able to get it. Um, pretty much resolved so I thought I would add it to this week's podcast yeah I was gonna push the episode of the podcast and do a bonus review of the update but um, since it the final thing that I tested worked out a lot better than I thought I thought I would put it all into one and have and stay up to date for the podcast Um, so I'm gonna talk about that first right off the bat and then the rest of the episode is just gonna be a quick update of everything else not too much new to talk about so um, that's why I'm leaving all of that stuff after this initial topic. Um, so, um, about a year, year and a half ago, I got a new laptop. So, um, overall, laptop's been doing great. Windows 11 has been okay. Um, except for one thing, which has been, which has bugged me and it gets super annoying when things like that happen. Same thing, or I have the same principle for smartphones, which is why I buy unlocked smartphones. Um, but basically over the past i want to say most basically for most of this year the issue i've had in is i think this is a a known like it's almost like meme level um knowledge where in windows 11 i don't know this happens in windows 10 as well but with almost every other update um or maybe every like second major update for windows they want to they keep asking me if i want to use onedrive um, office 365 and all of that stuff sign up for all that and i've already said no don't want it don't need it um everything is cloud-based or i use libra office or open office so i don't really need a office subscription it's like why do i want to pay for something i barely use so or or almost even never use i mean i use it in the workplace but that's through work so you know that's a whole separate thing that's that's a whole separate um idea so why do i want that so my whole theory was well when my service contract expires if i have no other issues with my laptop that i need to keep that con the service contract going and i need to stay on windows or whatever then i'm gonna switch back to linux so that happened i want to say about a month or two ago so i was like all right well let's see what which um linux distro do i want to switch to so my first thought was i'll go with kde neon um or kubuntu which both i've liked equally kde neon stays more up to date on the kde on on the plasma side of things while kubuntu has more um native support with all the ubuntu stuff so um either one is good it's a little bit behind on the plasma packages and stuff like that but it's not so far behind that it's um, terrible because I think it's not like they're on like it's KDE Plasma like 6.1 1 or something like that while KDE Neon's up to 6.2 whatever the latest package is KDE Neon stays more up to date. Um, so I was able to get KDE or I was able to get Kubuntu installed but the issue I ran into was that the theme engine is not really as up to date it keeps erroring out for me so i don't know if it's a lot of out of date packages they're not compatible with um kde plasma 6 or whatever so i was like well that's kind of a useless feature to me don't really need it so even though kde neon kind of worked which was weird because i was able to get kde neon 5 installed but not kde neon 6 so um as it turns out though so i was like all right well what other distros are out there that i would like um linux mint was fine but for some reason it felt really sluggish or noticeably sluggish even with the proper drivers and stuff installed so i'm like well that's not going to work for me so i'm like all right well let's see what other good ones are out there so i thought i would try um ubuntu budgie which 
um, the installation successfully uh, went through, you know, A through Z. But when I booted up, it got it, um, booted into a BusyBox command prompt. And doing a quick Google search, it turns out that there's certain commands that need to be done. It's a known issue for why that happened. So I was like, this is too much work. I just need something that works, you know? Um, so doing a little bit of research, it turns out that depending on when you bought, bought your uh, hardware or the laptop, you know, or hardware or whatever, and depending on how new it is, um, it may or may not be compatible with certain Linux functions like the kernel software drivers, what have you, you know, there's certain like random things that, you know, the normal, let's say everyday user um, generally doesn't need to know about. Um, I consider myself somewhere in the middle, so I'm definitely not, you know, IT tech support, nothing like that. But I'm, I don't consider myself an amateur user as well. I'm kind of in the middle so I can, you know, um, you know, build my own computer, troubleshoot common issues, generally fix my own stuff. If I had a desktop, I could, you know, and the sound card went bad, I could replace it with no issues, you know, stuff like that I can do. But once, when it comes to, let's say, you know, soldering a new um, capacitor or resistor onto a motherboard, I wouldn't be able to do that. I'd have to send it off to get service, you know, that kind of thing. So that's kind of where my abilities lie. So um, doing a little bit of research and stuff like that, um, it turns out that as long as the kernel was at least above version 6, then a distro should work. So um, like I said, Kubuntu installs fine, but it does have residual artifacting on the video card side of things. So it kind of feels like maybe the version was out of date or it wasn't fully compatible or something like that. So I was like, well, this works, you know, quote works, but it's not going to really be a long term solution. I'm not really a huge fan of the stock Ubuntu with GNOME or GNOME, however you want to pronounce it. Um, so I was looking around um, and certain and all the various distros have different kernel versions depending on the release. I was going to try KDE Neon 6.2 again, but the installer is still on the 22.04 LTS release of Ubuntu while supposedly the 24.04 fixes a whole bunch of issues with that installer. So I was like, well, if it's not installing to begin with, then that's not going to be a solution. And so I came across, um, or I started thinking about switching to like elementary OS, Endeavor OS, and I remember there was another distro called Zorin OS, the Z-O-R-I-N OS. Um, it's currently on version 17.2 and I saw that it was running on the Linux kernel 6.5, which I was like, that's unusual. Everyone else is still on either like 6.11, 6.2. Um, they're not necessarily all on um, the Ubuntu 24.04 LTS release. Most are, or some are still on 22.04 or some variation of that, um, you know, beyond that between those two releases. So for some reason, um, Zorin OS 17.2 is on the 24.04 release. It has the Linux kernel 6 version 6.5. So I was like, you know what final test is I'm going to try and install it see how it goes if it works then this is the distro I'm going to use um, I remember using 16 point or version 16.2 a few years ago and overall I did I liked it didn't mind it too much um, I don't remember why I didn't stick with it um, but it wasn't a terrible distribution um, overall the UI is great it's, think of it more of a Linux mint style um, distro where Everything is supposed to just work out of the box, but instead of having just the one UI, like, and no, no pun intended for Samsung there, but um, instead of having the single UI, I guess like Linux does with by running Cinnamon, with Zorin OS, you can pick between a few different UIs, notably uh, Mac OS style, Windows 11, 10, classic Windows, um, Chrome OS and all of that. So if you want to switch stuff up, you don't even need to switch distros. You can stay all in the same one. And a lot of stuff is supposed to just work out of the box. You can install software th third party or through the, their software center and all that. So I was like, all right, let me go through the installation, see how it goes. If it works, then that's the one I'll go with. And not to say it's the final one to use, but um, I'll make I'll stick with that one and um, keep using that one because like I said I didn't I never had any issues with version 16.2 so 
17.2 should be a lot, you know, con continue with the improvements. It's, um, the, you know, aside from just the one that works, it has a few different UIs and it's very much like Linux Mint in that it's a very, um, out of the box setup. Um, it's kind of basically supposed to be like, all right, well, if you've ever used Windows or Mac, this is kind of what we're going to do. Make the installers, um, or the UI very easy and native looking. Um, you should be able to easily get to your files. Uh, you have a browser, office suite and all of that stuff. And it pretty much holds to that very well. Um, so that aside, um, and long story short, the installation was successful. Everything installed well. Um, so far the visual drivers and all of that is working perfectly. I didn't have any issues, no hangups, freezes or anything like that. I was able to install um, Google Chrome as my default browser. Um, I got Dropbox installed and files synced on that. So um, as far as day-to-day -day usage goes, I'm pretty much up to par. Um, I was able to get my audio and video editing software installed. So the podcast side of things is not gonna be affected. So, um, and this episode is actually gonna be the first episode that I um, edit using Zorin OS. So let me know what you guys think. But um, overall, it was a very st simple and straightforward um, installation and update process. So I probably should have gone with that right off the bat. But I mean, and also on the flip side, to be fair to other distros, ultimately, they'll get up to speed and, you know, kernels will be updated depending on the release schedule and all that. As of this recording, Zorin OS for me is the one that worked and I was able to get through everything. So um, that's the one I'm going to go with. Ultimately, I figure KDE Neon will also be up to par uh, or up to date with their packages. So it will use the Ubuntu 24.04 release by default. But um, as far as KDE Plasma goes, there's a lot of themes or a few, the few themes that I tested, I had error or gave me errors with upon installing as far as the global themes go. I could set up the individual components, but I was like, this is a lot of manual work for that kind of theming where Zorin OS just takes care of it natively. So I can switch between a Mac OS look, Windows looks, Chrome OS, whatever I want. At the moment, I'm probably going to stick with the the Mac OS look. It's pretty nifty. Um, I do need to test the menu options for Dropbox and the, the Windows UI, but um, it doesn't. For that, it's not a huge deal just because I can go to the file manager directly for that. Um, but in general, um, that's so pretty much once the if you let's say you do own you did buy a new laptop like within the last year or so running Windows. Um, that's one of the things to consider is to make sure you're installing a distro that has an up-to-date kernel to handle the new hardware. Um, the other thing to note, and I will say this off the bat, is you do need to remember to turn off secure boot because I guess that's some incompatibility with Linux software. Um, I also did turn off UFI, uh, EUFI. Actually, now at this point, I don't remember, but I think leaving that on is okay, but on or off, you should be okay. But if you still have trouble with installing Linux with it on, then you can turn it off and install it. But um, I think secure boot though does cause problems with Linux installation. So turning it off um, is the thing to start with and then try installing the distro that you want and go from there. Um, but that being said, overall, I'm so far I'm giving an early recommendation to Zorin OS 17.2. Whether you're a beginner, or I shall put it this way, if you're not a developer, not in IT, or anything that requires, you know, certain advanced Linux um, components, then Zorin OS is the way to go. I mean, nothing against um, distros like Linux Mint, but with Zorin OS, it gives you that option of different UIs, so you don't have to worry about well, is it running KDE Plasma or Cinnamon or Gnome or anything like that? Zorin OS gives you all those options. And even if you don't need every single theme that they offer in the pro version, you can install, I think, what they call the core version, which includes a couple of themes. So if you just want a Windows theme out of the box because you're giving it to a family member or someone who just prefers that look or for, for yourself, if you prefer the Mac look or the Windows look, and don't really care about all the other themes, 
then go with Zoran OS. It gives you either one, so you can see if you like the uh, another UI or layout, but you don't really need to mess with anything. It gives you that Windows look right off the bat. Um, it gives you a start menu that's very familiar. Um, installing a package um, is as simple as double click on double clicking on it to install it. So um, Zoran OS does a really good job of. Um, not, I don't want to say mimicking, but giving you that functionality that you're familiar with that's very similar to um, what you would get on a Windows or Mac desktop environment. Um, so this is all for Zorin OS 17.2. I think Zorin OS 16.2 handled it pretty much the same way. About 17.2 has certain improvements, backend updates and refreshes and things like that. So you, it is definitely a good distro to go with as far as um, having an out of the box experience. So definitely give it a shot. Um, installation for me took about 15 to 20 minutes. So definitely not a long wait. The installation process is on par with a Windows um, installation process. I haven't done a Mac install lately, so I couldn't speak or I can't speak to that. But as far as comparing it to installing a Windows 10 or 11, it's pretty much on par. You know, you set your language, keyboard. Um, it'll ask you to um, if you want to install certain uh, multimedia components for uh, file compatibility. Um, if you wanted to download updates in the background while you're installing, it'll handle that. And then you set up your um, first user login info. Once you do that, you hit install. It'll confirm some stuff, and then you just go. You can you know go you know go watch a quick uh, TV show episode if your computer is new enough or fast enough. Watch a couple if it's a little bit older. When you come back, it'll be done. You hit reboot and you're ready to go. You have all the basic components installed. So a browser via Firefox, open um, an office suite to use and all of that. And then you can easily switch to, you know, Chrome or another browser if you want to use another one. And then it has a, a certain multimedia components like Blender and stuff like that installed. But you can uninstall those and switch to others if you want, like Audacity. Um, I think it has Kden Live installed. Um, so if you want to use that or OpenShot, you can uninstall one and install the other or whatever, but you're pretty much ready to go. Um, there are some updates when, depending on when you install it, ready to install for software and system. So you can go to the, the software center called Discover to install the software updates. You'll get a pop-up message for system updates to install those. So very familiar um, UI as far as the basic stuff like that goes. So. There's not a lot of guesswork, not a lot of poking around. You have, you know, the look is a little bit different, but not to the point where it's unfamiliar. They make it super simple and straightforward to the point where the learning curve is very minimal. So um, for now, early, you know, thoughts a couple days into it, depending on where you when you hear this episode is, I recommend Zorin OS 17.2 as the distro to use. Um, so as far as the rest of the episode goes, um, I did have a chance to watch the Walking Dead season two finale and overall not too bad. Um, Laurent was able to escape with Ash. Um, Daryl and Carol are stuck in France. So it looks like for season three, they're going to work on getting their way back home. So um, not really a big reveal there or a big surprise or anything like that, but um, they found a way to justify creating a season three, so we'll see what happens there. See if Carol updates Daryl on what she knows about Rick, if she knows anything, or if they kind of tie that all together as far as um, tying together what happened in the Walking Dead main show to the uh, to the rest of the universe and all that. Um, with the Penguin, we have him starting to flex his empire, dealing with the Maronis, and um, him making a uh, deal with Sophia to take down um, the penguin and all that. So I can't wait to see what they do in the season finale. Um, but overall, a good season seven. So I think the next episode is going to be the season finale. So um, look out for that review and I'll give my thoughts on the overall um, season. Um, but that being said, what I am planning to do is watch the Batman again um, by next week, just to, depending on when I, which one I watch first, um, I kind of want to see how I can tie them together if the Batman does show up in the finale, but if he doesn't show up, if they tie any of that together to see how they connect to each other or 
how well they keep each part, each the movie apart from the show, just to keep everything unique and all of that. So I'm really curious to see what they do in the finale. Um, but that being said, I did want to rewatch Zack Snyder's Justice League just to see how it holds up. I've been thinking about it for a while, and overall, not too bad. I did like it more the first time around. Uh, this time around, it wasn't terrible either. I did like it more than the original, but um, it does hold up as a, a, a weird issue for me because we don't have a Ben Affleck Batman movie yet, so I kind of, I do kind of want to see that, or um, I guess there might be the Justice League 2 in uh, production for 2025, but I haven't seen too much news on that, so I don't know if that's just a rumor or what's going on with that. But um, overall, as far as the Justice League goes, I did want to rewatch that and see how it holds up. And it's okay. I mean, it's a long, it's four hours long, so breaking it up into two or three parts is also um, okay, but not really. Um, worth going out of your way to watch again it's fine if you want just a brief version of it watch the original but if you want the full one watch the snyder cut so there's that um as far as real coaster goes just continuing to play that not too much to say aside from still playing that most of the levels are generally the same just different rides in each one so it's kind of uh formulaic as far as you open the park, you build up your entrance and parking lot, upgrade those, build rides, upgrade those as you get money and cards and things like that. Once you get enough hearts, you can proceed to the next level. So not too not too much variation there yet. So I'm, it's kind of getting repetitive for me. It's like, it is, as its name says, it is a good idle game. So, you know, if you want to kill, you know, 15 to 20 minutes of time at a time, then you can play this, you know, a little bit every day when you have some time or every couple of days or whatever and um, keep playing. But that is the one annoying thing is you do need to have enough hearts in order to proceed. I don't didn't find a way yet to, you know, buy more hearts or if you have a certain amount of cash to use the cash to buy hearts so you can proceed faster. The only thing I found so far to get around that to get hearts faster is to have VIPs and just keep pushing them through as fast as you can um, as they come in. So if you play the game, um, accept the VIP, collect the rewards and start the next one right after, use their bonus, their free boost to uh, run down the timer so you can keep running them through. And you know, if you play them for um, a few, you know, for a good, you know, 15, 30 minutes at every day and just keep pushing them through, um, boost, like running the countdown timer as fast as you can, then it should go pretty fast. Um, it does go faster as well if you have enough, um, attractions in the park so you collect more hearts at a time. So you can easily collect a good three to 400 hearts at a time and get up to 10 or 20k pretty fast. But it does take a, you know, if you're only playing, you know, 10 or 15 minutes every day, then it does take a few days to build it up so uh, something to consider there um, as far as my Ev Eternity 2 gameplay goes um, I did finish episode 1 so that full gameplay is up on YouTube now um, because of the tech support I've, or tech issues I've had the past couple of days you know finding a distro that works with my laptop um, I kind of really didn't have too much time or energy to play Doom so I will be resuming that um, soon so keep on the uh, keep your eyes out on the YouTube channel to um, um, to follow along with the gameplay but I am going to continue that very soon now that um, my laptop is back up and running again but overall it is a fun gameplay the graphics much like um, the Doom 3 mod for Doom 2 goes it was very good beautiful levels um, not as big of levels yet uh, pretty straightforward in general but not huge levels yet so we'll see how the rest of them go but i am very curious to see how the rest of the levels play out for the rest of the game so not too much of an update aside from the first episode is done so now i'm on to episode two but that is all for this particular episode so if you have any questions comments feedback or anything like that you can comment on this post um, on social media, all of them are linked on the website at headphonesneal.reviews along with past episodes, subscription links, and all of that good stuff. 
And of course, you can support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash patelin01, where you can get early access to the episode, which is ad-free, along with a link to the YouTube version, um, if you want that early as well. Um, so there's that at patreon.com slash patelin01. But that is all for this particular episode. Thanks for tuning in, and until next time.